The Virgin of the Cosmos Part 5 The central land alone, clear and serene, is favored as are those who inhabit her. She brings forth in a perpetual tranquility, she adorns and completes her offspring, she contends alone against all others, she triumphs, and like a worthy ruler partakes with the vanquished the fruits of victory. Explain to me further, my august mother, what it is that causes in living men during long maladies, an alteration of discernment, of reason, even of the soul itself. And Isis answered, Among animals there are those who have affinity with fire, others with water, others with earth, others with air, others again with two or three elements, or with all the four. Or, inversely, some have an antipathy for fire, some for water, some for earth, some for air, or again for two, three, or four elements. Thus, the locust and all kinds of insects flee from the fire, the eagle, the hawk, and other birds of flight fear the water, the fish dread the air and earth, the serpent abhors the open air, and like all crawling creatures loves the ground, all fishes delight in the deep, the birds in the air where they pass their lives, those who fly highest delight in the fire, of the sun, and sojourn in its vicinity. There are even certain creatures who disport themselves in the fire, such are the salamanders who have their abode in it. The elements enfold the body, and every soul inhabiting a body is weighed down and enchained by the four elements, wherefore, it is natural that the soul should have affinity with certain elements and aversion for others, for which reason she cannot enjoy perfect happiness. Nevertheless, as the soul is of divine origin, she struggles and meditates even beneath this bodily covering, but her thoughts are not what they would be if she were free from the body. And if the body be disturbed and troubled by sickness or by terror, the soul herself is tossed about like a man in the midst of tempestuous waves. You have given me admirable instruction, O oh my most powerful mother Isis, concerning the marvelous creation of souls by God, and I am filled with wonder, but you have not yet shown me whether souls depart when set free from bodies. Fain would I contemplate this mystery, and thank only you for the initiation. And Isis said, Listen, my son, for you most necessary inquiry holds an important place, and may not be neglected. Hear my reply. O great and marvelous scion of the illustrious Osiris, think not that souls on quitting the body mix themselves confusedly in the vague immensity and become dispersed in the universal and infinite spirit, without power to return into bodies, to preserve their identity, or to seek again their primeval abode. Water spilt from a vase returns no more to its place therein, it has no proper locality, it mingles itself with the mass of waters, but it is not thus with souls, O most wise Horus. And first I will tell you that water, being a body without reason, composed of myriads of fluid particles, differs from the soul which is, my son, a personal entity, the royal work of the hands and of the mind of God, abiding herself in intelligence. That which proceeds from unity, and not from multiplicity, cannot mingle with other things, and in order that the soul may be joined to the body, God subjects this harmonious union to necessity. Souls do not then return confusedly, nor by chance, 
into one and the same place, but each is dispatched into the condition which belongs to her. And this is determined by that which the soul experiences while yet she is in the tenement of the body, loaded with a burden contrary to her nature. Here therefore, this comparison, O beloved Horus, suppose that there should be shut up in the same prison, men, eagles, doves, swans, hawks, swallows, sparrows, flies, serpents, lions, leopards, wolves, dogs, hares, oxen, sheep, and certain amphibious animals, such as seals, hydras, turtles, crocodiles, and that at the same moment all the creatures should be liberated. All at once would escape, the men would seek cities and the public places, the eagles the ether, where nature teaches them to live, the doves the lower air, the hawks the higher expanse, the swallows would repair to places frequented by men, the sparrows to the orchards, the swans to districts where they could sing, the flies would haunt the proximity of the ground as high only as human exhalations extend for the property of flies is to live on these and to flit over the surface of the earth. The lions and leopards would flee to the mountains, the wolves to the solitudes, the dogs would follow the track of man, the hares would take themselves to the woods, the oxen to the fields and meadows, the sheep to the pastures, the serpents would seek the caves of the earth the seals and the turtles would rejoin their kind in the shallows and running waters, in order to enjoy, conformably to their nature, alike the proximity of the shore and of the deep. Each creature would return, conducted by its own interior discernment, into the abode befitting it. Even so every soul, whether human or inhabiting the earth under other conditions, knows whither she ought to go, unless, indeed, some son of Typhon should pretend that a bull may subsist in the waters or a turtle in the air. If, then, even when immersed in flesh and blood, souls do not infringe the law of order, although under penance, for union with the body is a penance, how much more shall they conform thereto when delivered from their bonds and set at liberty? Now this most holy law, which extends even to heaven, is in this way, O illustrious child, behold the hierarchy of souls. The expanse between the celestial and the moon is occupied by the gods, the stars, and the powers of providence. Between the moon and ourselves, my son, is the abode of the souls. The unmeasured air, which we call the wind, has in itself an appointed way in which it moves to refresh the earth, as I shall by and by relate. But this movement of the air upon itself impedes not the way of the souls, nor does it hinder them from ascending and descending without obstacle, they flow across the air without mingling in it, or confounding themselves therewith, as water flows over oil. This expanse, my son, is divided into four provinces, and into sixty regions. The first province from the earth upwards comprehends four regions, and extends as far as certain summits or promontories, which it is unable to transcend. The second province comprises eight regions in which the motions of the winds arise. Be attentive, my son, for you are hearing the ineffable mysteries of the earth the heavens and of the sacred fluid which lies between. In the province of the winds fly the birds, above this there is no moving air nor any creature. 
but the air with all the beings it contains distributes itself into all boundaries within its reach, and into the four quarters of the earth, while the earth cannot lift itself into the mansions of the air. The third province comprehends sixteen regions filled with a pure and subtle element. The fourth contains thirty-two regions, in which the air, wholly subtle and diaphanous, allows itself to be penetrated by the element of fire. Such is the order which, without confusion, reigns from depth to height, to wit, four general divisions, twelve intervals, sixty regions, and in these dwell the souls, each according to the nature thereof. They are indeed all of one substance, but they constitute a hierarchy, and the further any region is removed from the earth, the loftier is the dignity of the souls which dwell therein. And now it remains to be explained to you, O most glorious Horus, what souls they are who abide in each of these regions, and this I shall set forth, beginning by the most exalted. The expanse which stretches between earth and heaven is divided into regions, my son Horos, according to measure and harmony. To these regions our ancestors have given various names, some call them zones, others firmaments, others spheres. Therein dwell the souls who are freed from bodies, and those who have not yet been incorporated. The stations which they occupy correspond with their dignity. In the upper region are the divine and royal souls, the baser souls they who float over the surface of the earth are in the lowest sphere, and in the middle regions are the souls of ordinary degree. Thus, my son, the souls destined to rule descend from the superior zones and when they are delivered from the body, there they return, or even higher still, unless indeed they have acted contrary to the dignity of their nature and to the laws of God. For, if they have transgressed, the providence on high causes them to descend into the lower regions according to the measure of their faults, and in like manner also it conducts other souls, inferior in power and dignity, from the lower spheres into a more exalted abode. For on high dwell two ministers of the universal providence, one is guardian of the souls, the other is their conductor, who sends them forth and ordains for them bodies. This ends the Virgin of the Cosmos Part 5 on to Part 6.